and welcome to Conversations in Interventional Cardiology. My name is Allison DuPont. I am an interventional cardiologist at Northside Hospital in Lawrenceville, Georgia, and the ECMO program director there. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the Wellbeing Task Force of Sky. I'm honored to represent Jay Sky and the editor-in-chief, Dr. Alexandra Lansky. We're here today to discuss an important document published in Jay Sky titled Stretching Exercises to Reduce Musculoskeletal Disability Related to Pain Among Employees Working in Echocardiographic, Ultrasound, and Interventional Laboratories, a pilot study. And I'm joined by a very esteemed panel of leaders and experts. First off, we have Dr. Russell Gelfman, who is the lead author on the manuscript that we'll be discussing today. Dr. Gelfman is Medical Director of Work Rehabilitation and Assistant Professor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the College of Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. We have Dr. Mandeep Singh, uh, uh, who is in the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota as well, and co-author of the manuscript. We have panelist Dr. Nishta Sareen, who is Director of Women's Heart Program at Ascension Medical Group and Associate Professor of Medicine at Central Michigan University in Birmingham, Michigan. And Dr. Poonam Balagapudi, who is Structural and Interventional Cardiologist and Co-Chair of SKY Membership Committee and Chair of the SKY Women and in Innovations Committee, also a member of the SKY Education Committee. So I want to thank everyone here for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gelfman now to start the conversation. Dr. Gelfman? Thank you for inviting us to present our paper. And this is our study, Stretching Exercises to Reduce uh, Musculoskeletal Disability Related to Pain Among Employees Working in the Echocardiographic Ultrasound Interventional Laboratories. Uh, this is a pilot study. And as authors, we really have no conflicts of interest uh, to report. Just as a background, uh, what prompted this uh, study? Uh, the volume of cardiovascular procedures have increased over time. Uh, fluoroscopically guided interventional procedures and also non-invasive imaging. Uh, musculoskeletal pain is common. Uh, if forceful, awkward, and prolonged static postures uh, tend to predispose to uh, discomfort. Uh, the use of lead aprons, uh, particularly in the areas that do the uh, use of radiographic uh, equipment. Uh, ergonomics has not fully solved all of these problems. Uh, because of this, and also I get to treat uh, some of our employees uh, that have difficulties, uh, Dr. Singh, who initiated this study, uh, contacted us and asked us to kind of help out with some of this. Uh, they had done some prior work, their group, uh, looking at surveys of physician and allied health staff that work in our labs, and well over half reported musculoskeletal pain. 30% sought medical care for this pain, so it was bad enough to seek care, and 29% had current pain at the time of their previous study. So the pilot study to see if we could reduce musculoskeletal disability was uh, initiated. And the idea was to, to think about something simple. So stretching exercises were of interest because uh, they do improve range of motion. Uh, they improve viscoelastic properties of muscle tendon. Uh, they reduce discomfort and pain. There really are no costs, the exercises themselves. They're simple to learn and they're simple to perform daily. And we were able to have people do this within 15 minutes uh, on a given day. So in terms of the study design, uh, it's a voluntary study. It was unblinded, non-randomized, but it did last an entire year. Uh, our employees at uh, all of the lab facilities, uh, so it'd be here in Rochester, in Arizona, in Florida, and in the health system, were invited to by email uh, if they worked in interventional lab. The survey included the demographics, uh, activity habits, work environment, whether they'd had medical problems or musculoskeletal pain, and also uh, involved in, uh, giving them functional scales to complete. We chose the DASH for upper extremity disability, uh, the neck disability index for neck, and the Roland Morris questionnaire for low back. An active participant was considered someone or a person that agreed to complete the initial survey. They had to learn the stretching exercises. 
Those were designed by one of our senior physical therapists, Steve Higgin, and he put together a nice package and also did a video of that, as well as there was a poster. They had to do the stretching regularly. They had to complete biweekly email surveys for a year, and then there was a final survey. A control participant would be someone who did the complete initial survey, chose not to exercise regularly, but completed a final survey. We won't discuss much of those as part of this. Uh, we have a little bit of information in the paper, but it was a very small group that wanted that ended up being a control. Uh, most that did participate were active participants. Uh, the, 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 really, the initiative or the thing we're looking for with the study is it will help to answer whether employees will voluntarily stretch regularly over time and if it might help reduce musculoskeletal disability. So are they safe and is there an apparent any apparent efficacy. The results, uh, we had a total of 4,387 eligible employees, of which only 479 responded to, and of that group, only 196 agreed to participate. Of that group, only 64 had complete data surveys for baseline, biweekly, and one-year follow-up. Three of them had data for the surveys at baseline, uh, did the biweekly stretching, but didn't complete all of the final survey. Four had data for surveys at baseline and one-year follow-up, but didn't stretch. That technically would have been the control group. About a half of them were either technical, uh, sorry, technician or technologist, nurse or physician, and the other half had more office-type activities, such as manager, supervisor, or medical assistant. Most of this group was 40 years of age and female. It turns out that that also would match a demographic if you were to look at interests. So if you look at interests, say, in medicine or health, um, women over age 40 would be a, a demographic that would have an interest in there. So to kind of really summarize things, we had a small group of interested participants where we were able to get baseline, monitor compliance, and have follow-up. Uh, baseline self-report show they're a relatively active group. Only 30 of the 196 answered no to all activity questions that we did. So this wasn't a group of couch potatoes. Uh, more than half preferred stretching before work. And these were our results. So on the left is baseline. On the right will be follow-up for these uh, graphs. The dash is on your left. The, the, the neck disability index is on your right. And you could see that um, we had a significant drop in self-reported disability between the beginning or the start of the year and the end of it. And that was statistically significant. Uh, we also had a, uh, on the neck disability index, had a drop between baseline and year. And that also would be statistically significant at, the, uh, at that P level. In terms of the Roland Morris questionnaire, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, there wasn't. There was a lot of people that really had no back pain or disability related to it, so that made it hard to really track anything. And as you can see, when we looked at the whole group, there were so many asymptomatic people that we didn't really see a drop in their their mean Roland Morris questionnaire. Uh, report, self-report. However, if we took out all of the the people who had a started with a zero uh, back pain, um, you, you were left with about 36 people who had something greater than zero initially. And even that group showed an improvement over the year. So um, that was kind of interesting. That really is the, the, the major uh, outcomes from this study. And we would conclude that a regular stretching program may be a reasonable option to reduce upper extremity musculoskeletal disability employees working in echocardiographic ultrasound and interventional labs. Other things, though, to consider uh, is that the nice part about the intervention, it's either low or no cost. Um, the exercises themselves don't cost anything. Whether or not you want to provide time to do them could potentially add a little bit of cost. Um, no injuries were reported due to the stretching program. Uh, a big lesson, participation in a voluntary stretching program may be low. Uh, we had to get a very highly motivated group. Um, no information about whether this intervention would reduce work-related injuries. 
I think if we wanted to confirm this, it would take la larger randomized trial of stretching exercises uh, and see if they come out with similar benefits. But one of the big barriers that would also need to be addressed is there need to be some methods to encourage participation. And with that, um, I guess I would open things to the panel. Thank you so much. Fantastic overview of the paper, which I know we've all reviewed. Um, you know, I, one thing that's striking to me, and, and the, the Wellbeing Task Force of Sky is really focused on both physical and mental well-being. Um, this is a new task force within Sky, um, and I co-chair that with Dr. Hermiller. And one of the things that's come up in conversation multiple times is the fact that OSHA really, as it pertains to protecting people who are in cardiovascular medicine, um, wearing lead every day, echocardiographers who are le leaning over patients all day. There really isn't a lot of guidance. OSHA provides a lot of guidance in terms of um, protection from injury in a lot of occupations, but they really don't provide any kind of guidance uh, or regulation um, as it pertains to, to people in our industry. So um, what, what do you think is the next step here? Maybe Dr. Singh can answer that because I know that he was kind of the mastermind behind this, as you mentioned, Dr. Gelfman. So any yeah. thoughts on that, Dr. Singh? Thank you, uh, Russell, for uh, uh, presenting the uh, seminal uh, pilot study. Um, as, as Russell mentioned, the, uh, the main barrier for us is, uh, is uh, not only doing a larger randomized study, but encouraging the uh, uh, the uh, the participants who are actually at risk uh, for these musculoskeletal and orthopedic issues, um, encourage them to participate in, in such studies, which practically doesn't have any cost or risk to it. Um, the the issues I, I've spent, um, this is my 33rd year in interventional lab. So uh, uh, I, can, I can speak for what the issues can be, and 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 based on what my and and my colleagues experience in the lab, um, led to uh, a series of papers starting 2015 um, that this is a very prevalent issue uh, affecting almost uh, more than half of us, and more so surprisingly uh, about 80 to 90 percent of people who are working in the echo lab. Um, so it's not just the radiation uh, that is affecting us, but it is just the uh, poor ergonomics of the whole system um, that is also contributing significantly to the problem. Uh, so if I have to think about what are the root causes of the problem, I think it stems from the fact that um, in the last 33 years of my career, and I think before that, the layout of cath lab hasn't changed. We still have the same equipment, same layout, same monitor. Uh, and I think one, first thing I would want to see, and maybe that is affecting our, our um, uh, musculoskeletal issues, is how the, the layout of the lab is. So all the equipment is on the backside. We have to pivot 100 times to get it. Um, so facilitating that in a way that is convenient for us, I think, would definitely help. Um, we are becoming lead less um, protection uh, from radiation is the key. I actually uh, weighed myself um, during COVID. Uh, wearing a pepper and a lead was extra 20.5 pounds uh, wearing the whole day. So it wears you out over time and it's 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 a marathon that's not going to uh, end soon uh, for for uh, cardiologists who are beginning their interventional careers um, so moving to lesser weight leaded aprons or maybe a leadless apron environment in the cath lab would be uh, the other uh, way to go uh, i would also extend this that I think we are exposed to radiation so much uh, that we still haven't been able to um, document clearly that the radiation is affecting our health um, more than just 
cataracts uh i think the cancer that is happening amongst the interventional cardiologists happen maybe after they retire the tracking system is not there uh the uh, deterministic effects of radiation manifest after uh we are gone from the cath lab um so that's the second so uh, one would be the layout the posture um and the second would be how uh we can protect ourselves from from radiation and then the lead apron right so that's the other issue um whether we do two piece one piece i think it's going to be affecting us over time uh so any remedial measures to make us lead less and protect us from radiation would be the third piece that i think would lead to uh improvement in our musculoskeletal health and also probably uh protection from uh from uh cancer related issues that are also poorly studied mhm absolutely very very good points um dr velakapudi and dr serene um how are you surprised by how difficult it was to to get people to do this study i mean it seems like a pretty simple study I would have thought that most of the people who responded to the survey would participate. Dr. Velagapudi, I've seen her doing yoga stretch poses with her cath lab staff in the control room um mm-hmm. on Twitter before. So, I mean, do you think it would be similar in your institution? It would be this difficult to get people involved? Um so I think any so just in general for these survey kind of uh, co- you know questionnaires or surveys uh, it's always the response rate is around 10 to 20% and that's just across and getting a 10% is a lot actually and now if you're getting people to do a, a you know exercises for a year um I can really imagine so I think the response rate was appropriate as you would see in any other uh, study what actually struck my eye is that the mean or average the number of years these people have been working is around close to 15 to 20 i think so this is only a, a, this is a trial that was a you know a study for a, only a year no and it improved now imagine if this was done very early and through um, you know even before people started i think it that would be really helpful so that's one thing that caught my attention but obviously this uh, the number of participants it seems like it's and in terms of the uh, cat lab yoga exercises it was the staff in at <laughs> Nebraska who between it caught my attention because between cases they actually a couple of people are actually waiting and then they they would do this yoga and i would chip you know jump in and then participate with them because it was um, quite helpful now i also have one other comment um, before i let nish to speak is that you know we this is a great starting point for a study we have bunched a lot of people physicians non physicians people working with ultrasound radiation wearing lead and all that and so i think it'll be nice because even even just comparing uh, interventional cardiologists to interventional radiologists we get 2 to 10 times more radiation based on you know some other papers i've seen um and so it's really important so we probably are wearing lead for longer durations and, uh, and uh, compared to us even the staff who are in the lab all the time maybe wearing lead for longer durations um and we don't use our hands as much as an ultrasound technician might use so it'd be nice to see, actually see if the exercises the different exercises matter for different groups um and maybe that's why the uh, back uh, improvement you know there's not a lot of uh, improvement in the back pain sort of uh, there was improvement in the group that actually had back pain but not in the others but i guess maybe doing those interventions based on what the person's actually doing um may be something to think about for future um to actually plan um you know the actual set of exercises maybe your physical therapist would know what to do for the upper arms and necks and you know back um so i just thought i'd throw it out there those are but a great great um, initiative and study uh, it's so important for us in the cat lab mm-hmm. nish that you have any comments Yes, thanks Allison. Um Dr. Gelfman, outstanding presentation. Dr. Singh, I think the concept, uh the the planning and the implementation of the study is uh, really impressive. It's tough to get such a great enrollment and to have people adhere for a year as Poonam already alluded to. Um it's a really important question that it addresses in a prospective manner. 
Of course, this is a proof of concept study and larger studies will be required uh, across the board to see if this is applicable at a larger level. Um, but one of the things that kind of struck me is that when we look at our cat lab staff, they have different levels of baseline physical activity. Some of them are very physically active and some of them are not as physically active and they engage more in stress eating. And it would be nice to see which group was impacted the most as physical activity at baseline, uh, physical, um, you know, what their um, what their exercise level is at baseline, how does that affect uh, the, uh, and whether it changes the exercise duration, I see it was 15 minutes for the study, or the type of stretches that are performed, and also if these effects last uh, beyond one year, and what's the adherence beyond one year, but I must congratulate you for uh, doing the study. And of course, because of women heart, I'm going to say, of course, from the study, pregnant women were excluded. But it would be interesting to know also, uh, you know, what are the safe options for a pregnant staff in the uh, cat lab or in the echo lab? Thank you. Excellent points. Um, doc Dr. Gelfman or Dr. Singh, would you like to make any closing remarks about the study before I make my closing remarks? Uh, I just wanted to make one other comment because you not very many people have alluded to it, but on a treatment standpoint, so we do see our our employees who do get hurt or have pain. And one of the other group is the ultrasonographers. And one of their challenges is, is some of them are, are, are not very large and they're working with some very large patients. And a lot of times in order to hold the ultrasound probe, they're reaching around the person and, and having to really bury the probe in to be able to get optimal imaging. And that, those forces in those positions are, are just bad in general. Um, you wouldn't do something like that in a factory environment. And the fact that we do that to our own employees in a healthcare environment, I think is a, a concern. Yeah. Can I just add a couple of points? Uh, first, if we are to do a bigger study, I think uh, organizations like Sky um, or other national organizations, uh, their participation and involvement would be the key. Um, that's number one. Um, number two, um, what we saw in the uh, 2015 survey uh, and that was borne out again, was that the prevalence of uh, musculoskeletal issues are higher in technologists and nursing staff. Um, and maybe that is the kind of work that they do in addition to wearing the lead. Um, they have to transfer patients and they don't have any other rotation other than being in the cath lab on a daily basis. So, so that's the second point. The third point is that patients who, oh, sorry, the, the participants who um, participated in the study um, had to be motivated. So, for example, our cath lab staff who had musculoskeletal issues um, were transferred out or they took voluntary retirement. So it's not a snapshot of patients that we uh, see on a daily basis. It's a very select group of motivated individuals who then said, we will do it. So whether we need to cherry pick patients and participants who had this problem, um, who have musculoskeletal issues, maybe that is the subgroup that will benefit the most from stretching. But I would underscore the uh, effort that Russell and his team had done to build these stretches and make a video uh, and, and distribute it amongst our staff. That was the, the primary motivator for them um, to, to become a part of this, this important study. But I think if we have to make this, uh, and I would, I would urge Sky maybe to take a lead because they have this wellness group um, to maybe um, disseminate this information and make the other interventional groups uh, aware that such no-cost interventions are available so that they can improve their own musculoskeletal health. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Velagopudi, do you want to make another comment about 
the stretching. Yeah, uh, I know. I was just uh, typing. Um, so I, I think we should also look at the mental health after exercise, like before and after, because the exercise really releases something that makes you so happy, especially group mm -hmm. exercise. Um, so I'm just, I think that's yeah. uh, also something that could be looked at if you're looking at a larger study. How do you feel before and then after if there's any improvement in the happiness quotient or... <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think that's an, that's an important point, right? Absolutely. And I really like the point you made earlier, um, Dr. Vlogapudi, about, um, you know, more of a preventative approach to it in maybe in future studies, because, um, you know, the younger you start doing this, the less likely you are to have an injury, most likely, um, although we don't know that. Um, so that would be another interesting thing to look at. You know, we don't teach fellows how to, um, you know, how to stand in the cath lab even, right? You see people slouching over the cath table. Um, you know, they don't have their radiation shields in the right places. So, you know, the, all of these things that we don't teach our fellows probably we need to focus a little bit more on that. And this kind of data really could drive that. So I'd like to congratulate the authors on, on publishing this really important manuscript. I think this really opens the door for a lot of conversations in this important field, a problem that affects all of us. Um, and I think that um, this will affect staff wellness as well as physician wellness going forward if we can continue to build on this. I'd like to thank all of our panelists and participants and thank you everyone for your attention. <laughs>